for this documentary, Color Me Obsessed, and you're okay with the footage being used in the film? Uh, I am fully aware of the details, and I am okay with it. I'm, uh, my name is Greg Norton. I used to be in a little band here in Minneapolis called Husker Du. Um, sort of about the same time that the replacements were uh, up and coming. Sound that was good. Okay. Uh, all right, Greg, let's then just start right from, uh, tell us about the scene in the beginning. I mean, here, uh, two, uh, all right, and look, I, I am a fan. I will, I, I, two of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time came out of this little town that's in the middle of nowhere. Yep. <laughs> Oh, thanks. You're Appreciate the first it. Person I can say that too, that I've called people and talked with them for this, this documentary. Um, tell us about the scene, the, end, the whole the start of the scene. Well, you know, uh, uh, in, in the late 70s, there was a, a bar downtown here just a few blocks away called uh, Jay's Longhorn. And uh, that, that pretty much was the epicenter of, of the Minneapolis punk scene. Uh, it was the bar where any national or international touring bands would, would play. Uh, the Stranglers played there, Elvis Costello played there, the Buzzcocks, Gang of Four, Blondie, you know, I, I, I could go on and on. Uh, 1978 was, was basically the, the first year that I started hanging out at the Longhorn and uh, I was hanging out with Grant Hart at the time. This is a good year before Husker Du even, even got together. And, uh, you know, the big local bands at the time were the Suicide Commandos um, and uh, the Suburbs and, and um, the Flaming O's and, and, and a handful of other bands. But so that was that was the scene. And uh, in Grant being from South St. Paul, Minnesota, I grew up in Mendota Heights. Uh, you know, we were kind of sort of outsiders because we weren't from the South Minneapolis neighborhood. And we used to joke that, uh, you know, the local fanzine in, in the early part of the day was called Incest. And we always joked that it was um, appropriately titled because the scene, there seemed to be a lot of incest in the, in the, the scene if you weren't from the right neighborhood. So um, when Husker Du finally got together a year later, it was, it was like we were trying to, to force ourselves through a barrier. Uh, also in South Minneapolis, there was a record store called Orfolk, uh, Orfolk Joke Opus, which brilliant record store. Everybody went there to buy, you know, the latest singles or whatever. And uh, the, the guy who ran the store, uh, Peter Jesperson, I'm sure you, you know who Peter is. Uh, you know, he was kind of the local tastemaker. And once Husker first got together and started playing gigs at the Longhorn, which actually we would find out that we had a gig at the Longhorn by picking up the local, um, what's now is the city pages, and uh, all of a sudden be scanning the, the Longhorn ad, and it's like, holy crap, we're playing, we're opening Friday night, you know, and we'd go down and we'd play and we'd get paid 25 bucks, and shortly after that, all of a sudden, the replacements burst on the scene. It was sort of one of Peter's pet projects, you know, and, um, and actually, uh, uh, on the way up today, I, I listened to um, uh, the Heartbreakers, uh, LAMF, and, uh, and, and thought back to that very first replacements gig that I ever saw because they played a bunch of material off that record. And, you know, and it got me thinking how much of that was, was actually the boys or, and how much of that was Peter Jesperson's influence. Because Peter kind of took the replacements under, under his wing and, uh, you know, that was his, his project then. And um, uh, I'm guessing that Peter had a fair amount of influence on what the, uh, what the boys were listening to at, at the time. And uh, I think it definitely influenced their sound. So. Those were kind of initial impressions there, but uh, yeah, I remember the, the first time seeing them at the Longhorn, we were all kind of like, you know, like, who, wow, who are these guys? You know, it's like, okay. Um, you know, we were, we were kind of obsessed with, uh, with, with playing hard and fast, and uh, it, these guys roll out, and they're playing um, hard and loose. And uh, you, you know exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. And, and, that, uh, and, and to me, I think that, that's where, you know, the, you know the, the friendly rivalry between the two bands, like, really started. You know, it's, um, 
not not to 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 throw this cliche out but but it was sort of like we were you know they were the the rolling stones and we were the the beatles so um it was a good rivalry well, i mean was it i mean but was it real or was it more just the, the band seemed to like take up on it uh no there was there was a healthy amount of you know it's it's not like we um we, we all got along. We were all friends, you know, it's, it's a small town. Everybody ends up at the same house parties after the club closes and all that. So, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of camaraderie, but there was, was uh, this, this um, you know, this healthy rivalry that, that really kind of, I think, pushed both bands. Um, you know, I, I think both bands wanted to see the other band as the second best band in town. Now, did, did you guys play together a lot? You know, not so much. Um, you know, the, the, the one gig that, 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 uh, that really stands out that we did play together was our first show in New York. Uh, we played Great Gildersleeves. Right. Peter Jesperson got the band on that bill. And when at the end of the night, when we went to get paid, I was kind of blown away by the fact that the club wasn't going to pay the replacements anything. And uh, the the local opening band, the Young and the Useless, got paid a hundred bucks, you know. And I'm thinking like, well, geez, I mean, these guys are on the road, and, and they're like, eh, hey, nope, screw it, these guys aren't getting paid. And they, you know, I was like, wow. But uh, um, you know, saw a lot of their shows. Is that the first time? That was the first time for both of you guys in New York. So yes. Wow. Yeah. That '83, right? I believe so. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, probably saw, probably went to more of their shows and we actually played together. Um, and, and I think that part of that was, you know, Peter, Peter's influence as the manager and, and, and who he kind of wanted, where he wanted them to play or the shows that he wanted them to be on type of thing. And, um, you know, the replacements being on Twin Tone, uh, Husker, we, we cut a demo in uh, 1980 and uh, uh, sent it off to, uh, to Twin Tone. It was three songs, um, Paul Stark, Charlie Hallman, and Peter Jesperson, the three main principals in Twin Town. Each one of them liked a different song and none of them could come to a consensus on any of them. So they passed and said, we're not interested in working with you. So we started our own record label called Reflex. Put out our uh, put out the uh, put out our, our own record, and then eventually started putting out other local bands. So we kind of had our little the reflex scene going on, and then there was like the twin tone thing going on. So uh, there, you know, there there weren't a whole lot of shows that 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 were you know where both bands played together. Did, uh Right. Um, did, did you enjoy? I mean, was this a band you enjoyed watching, or I, and, and or did, did, did sometimes did you like? I mean, when, when they were playing hard and tight and perfect, or perfect just for pleasure to play live. Uh, I mean, was that something you enjoyed? And versus the well, the sloppy replacements. Right. Well, you know, in in the early days, I would say that that they were more together, uh, and and they were a lot of fun to watch you know you've got Tommy bouncing around the stage you know jumping around in his in his uh, um, you know his suede creepers and and uh, you never knew what Bob was gonna do um, you know Paul was was right up front and and just giving it his all and Chris Mars was you know uh, the early band was was I think really good uh, as as the band got bigger and started to go out and tour more they um, that that's sort of where they I see them getting the reputation and and this is me speaking from talking to other people out on the road where it's like oh the replacements were just through town and they'd be like okay let me guess it was either the greatest rock and roll show you ever saw or it was the worst rock and roll show that you ever saw and ultimately the answer was yes one or the other and uh, it, it's like you know when they were on they were on but when they were not on it was way out you know to the point where they would you know, start trying to play cover songs that they didn't know, <laughs> uh, which is always a lot of fun. 
Uh, but uh, one of my favorite stories is, and, and I want to say it was either somewhere in Kentucky or Tennessee or someplace, and they were, there was like, um, like a kiddie pool backstage that they dr dragged out and put on the stage and then they all jumped in it and pretended like they were playing in a kiddie pool. So, there you go. Yeah, you know, and then um, uh, another another story that I always liked was actually when uh, they were recording um, "Pleased to Meet Me" down in Memphis, and uh, it came time for Bob Stinson to do play all of his solos, and he couldn't play any of them. And Paul said, "Well, what the hell were you playing out on the road?" And his response was, "I don't know stuff." So you know, I think that really kind of summed up Bob right there and that was basically the end of Bob and the band you know so uh, you know once once Chris left the band and once Bob left the band the band really did change quite a bit as you know I mean they were well they, they got professional you know it's I don't want to say they grew up but uh, you know all of a sudden uh, Paul I believe realized how important the business side of things were so Uh, we signed in to Warner's in September of '86, and I think yeah, they signed before us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tim came out in '85. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. But yeah, no, we were definitely rooting for them. Uh, you know, Minneapolis really did have a, a a fantastic scene. Everybody did support everybody else. You know, there wasn't, you know, even you know there was, you know, even even crossover with, uh, uh, you know, Prince. And, and the time and all that stuff and and, uh, and and First Avenue was the center of the rock and roll universe as far as we were concerned at, at, you know in 83 84 um, so yeah everybody everybody really did support each other and yeah we were rooting for those guys I, I was loved the, the performance on Saturday Night Live and Bob's outfit and the way that he had it rigged where he was gonna you know flash the camera if he had a chance, but uh, but he didn't. So. Did you, what were the weirdest things you ever saw about where? Uh, well, of course, there's the uh, the naked encores. That uh, there's the dresses. There's you know I don't know. What are the naked encores? I haven't heard those. I've, I've heard it clean start naked. Maybe it's the same thing. With, yeah, basically. Yeah. We just come out with pretty encore with just the guitar. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the um, was. I mean, what was, I mean, this year you guys stayed, yeah, you guys stayed with one core unit for your run. Um, what was the reaction in town when, when, uh, on the scene when Bob was doing it? Uh, you know, I, I think, I think there were a lot of mixed emotions there. You know, I think a lot of people realized that, that, uh, uh, you know, if, if the band was going to progress any further than they had, uh, you know, they needed, you know, and here it boils back down to that, that professionalism thing and, and like, you know, realizing that, well, we just can't be goofballs all the time. Um, you know, and, and actually I think Slim was a good fit with the band. Um, you know, excellent guitar player and, and so, uh, and, and probably in a way it made Paul's life easier uh, as far as writing music and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, and when, um, you know, Steve Foley replaced Chris Mars, it, you know, it was still somewhat of a head, head scratcher to some people, but, um, but Chris wanted out, you know, he wanted, so. As a, as a bass player, how was, you saw Tommy when he took the stage at, what, 12 or 13? Yeah, I think he was probably, yeah, 13. How, how yeah. was he as a bass player then, and how did he progress? Uh, well, you know, he, uh, uh, like I said, he, he, he jumped around a lot, he flailed around a lot. Um, you know, as I was listening to that uh, Heartbreakers record, you know, you, you can, I could sort of see how 
a lot of those bass lines were, were big influences on his playing through the rest of his career. You know, basically he, he grew up in rock and roll clubs, you know. Uh, most of the time sitting in the dressing room, sometimes sitting in the van because the club wouldn't let him in except for, you know, when they were on. Uh, but still, you know, it's, uh, it'd be an interesting way to, to grow up, no doubt, so. They, they mentioned Jesperson before. Um, do you feel that he was in a way the fifth member of the band? I mean, without them, without him, it probably would have self-imploded or? Uh, well, yeah, I, I think he, he probably, yeah, in, in the early years, I think he did kind of, kind of hold things together for him. Uh, you know, he, he got out, he opened a lot of doors for him. He got them, you know, out on the road and, and uh, but like the Gildersleeves gig, it's, you know, he got him out to New York, but, you know, he wasn't able to get, get him any money, you know. So, um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure at what point where, uh, uh, you know, Peter and, and, and uh, the band parted ways exactly, but, um, Okay. Yeah, I mean, if, I think like if Bob was in August or something of that year. I think it was the right thing in the year. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, and 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 uh, you know maybe that was it. Maybe you know Peter's role was was somewhat more of a caretaker type of thing. And then once, um, you know, maybe at that point, Paul decided, well, you know, we can take care of ourselves. I don't know. I'm I'm just guessing here. So. What? Um, no, when you, you said I know you guys played the uh, Gildersleeve. Shortly thereafter, one of the interviews I did mentioned something about uh, both of you playing Folk City. I don't know if it was the same night though. Yeah, it it wasn't the same night, but but it was uh, yeah that was the um, it was the same trip for both bands right. though. So we played uh, Folk City a couple weeks later, and. Um, Robert Christigo told me uh, told me that night that I had the greatest mustache in rock and roll. And, uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, and um, yeah, so we did not share that bill. That was the only bill that we shared in New York was the Gildersleeves. Gildersleeves. Yeah. And Robert speaks very highly of you guys too. Yeah, I, uh, I interviewed Robert a few weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, did you guys ever share a bill here in Minneapolis? You know, I'm going to guess and say that we probably did, but, it, you know, there again, nothing uh, like, you know, is jumping out and, and uh, going like, oh, yeah, remember that, that one show? Um, and, and there again, I think it was probably, you know, uh, it, like who's going to headline, you know? No, I was just going to say. Right. So, yeah. and, and that's probably why we didn't play a whole lot of shows together because of the fact it's like, okay, well, who's headlining, you know? I thought I had heard of one show where you both picked your turns playing really short sets. That hmm. sounds familiar? No, not really. It, it could have happened. Yeah, or you it know. could be folklore. I mean, it, right. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, somebody just you know, sent me a DVD of us playing in a basement somewhere in Minneapolis, and I'm like, I have no idea where that is. I, I can't remember when <laughs> it was. So, you know. Now, do you think you got your, your sound influenced early, the first couple of records, the, the, the fast? Uh, I, I don't think we were a, 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 an, an influence on them. You know, I, it's, um, you know, both bands did kind of listen to a lot of the same stuff. You know, the, the New York Dolls, the, the Heartbreakers, um, you know, all that stuff. The Ramones. Uh, you know, Husker had a little bit also, you know, we, we had our, 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 our side of... of um, material that was really influenced by what was coming out of Manchester, England. Uh, you know, Joy Division and, and uh, the Buzzcocks and, and um, you know, that, that type of stuff. Whereas I think Westerberg's influences have always been more, you know, leaning towards American bands like Big Star and, and stuff like that, so. Right. Um, I, I, I liked it. You know, I thought it was, it was, I thought they were, you know, it wasn't, uh, uh, they were just 
tipping their hat to us, you know, type of thing. So. Did you did you answer with something on one of the references? I don't think we did. Okay. Yeah. Um, as the as the band's sound changer, I mean, so uh, the first two albums are uh, I don't I can't call them hardcore, but they're harder and faster. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe Sting borders on hardcore a bit, um, but then Hoot Nanny is something altogether different. Right. Um, I mean. Were you guys still, I mean, were you still digging, were you still digging the sound as they started changing and then we got, we got to Let It Be, which with Paul's, you know, unsatisfied and Enter Machine and so forth? Uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, with, with both bands, as, it, you know, you look at the early stuff and as the bands progress, you can, you can see the, the growth and maturity as, as songwriters and musicians. And, uh, you know, Paul obviously has a very good ear for um, for catchy tune, and um, you know, for me, I, I I I liked how they evolved. You know, and uh, obviously for for a lot of fans out there, they're always going to have fans that are going to be like, ah, those guys sold out. You know, it's like ah, they suck now and all that stuff. But uh, you know, because fans, you know, a lot of times they get into a certain part of, of the band's career if, you know, when they get in there early and they don't, and that's what they love and they don't want to see that change and when it starts to change then they're like, ah, these guys, you know. So. Did, uh, what would be, if, if you were to look at the replacements catalog, what's your favorite album there's? Um, yeah, actually, Please to Meet Me is, um, I like that one quite a bit. Listen, to, I, I did listen to Stink on the way up today too. That that's always a fun record. So, um, if let, let, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the scene and, and, and what you guys had here. Did you realize what you guys had with these two highly influential bands? Uh, not, not, you know, in 83 now, you know, um, you know, maybe by 85, we're starting to think like, oh, yeah, there's something going on, you know, and, and, um, you know, by the time you get to, to 86, 87, when both bands are, are on major labels and, and we're, you know, out touring with, with, uh, you know, other major groups and, and then it's like, yeah, there's, this is something really special here, so. You guys broke up in 89? Uh, we broke up in uh, January of 88. Oh, 88. We played our last show uh, in December of 87. Okay. Yeah. So you really put out quite a bit of material there. We did. Here. Yeah. You did. And especially Andy with the double album. I mean, uh, in the way you, by the way, both you and replacements influenced other Pretty much every rock band I, you know, hear, and every rock band being guitar, two guitars, bass, and drums, uh, to me at this point, owes something to the two of you guys. Uh, does, did it? Were you? Did both new bands come too soon? I mean, and then because I mean, a few years later, you've got this Seattle scene, which to me was just, you know, uh, uh, putting you guys in a blender, and, and you know, and even and even coming out with Flatware Clap, uh, you know, uh, flannel. Did it, did it bother you, or did, it, did, it, did you guys think, yeah, maybe we were just too early, or what was the reaction? Yeah, well, you know, I think for, for you know, one, one of the things that, that both bands did was, was get out and just demonstrate that, that you can just be yourself and, uh, and play really great music and, and not be bothered by, uh, you know, um, friends or, 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 you know, oh, I need to do this to be cool. It's like, no, you just go out and you just do your thing and, and you are cool. And, um, you know, I think both bands definitely, that was, that was our, our attitude. You know, it's, it's, uh, we, we didn't really give a shit about what anybody else thought about how we looked or what we sounded like. We were doing what we wanted to do. Um, yeah, and granted, you know, we, we, both bands played Seattle quite a bit, and obviously, you know, you can you can kind of look at 
some bands that came out of that. And, and certainly a lot of those bands cited both The Replacements and Husker Du as, as big influences on their careers. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think we can take credit for uh, the look. You know, I'm sure we all wore ripped up jeans and flannel shirts because we always did. But then again, so did uh, John Fogarty with Credence and Neil Young, you know. So uh, it, it certainly wasn't anything new um, until all of a sudden they started wearing it and then it was, it was labeled, you know, so. Did, uh, do you feel, I mean, you guys always took a much more of a business approach to the way you ran things, or whatever. And obviously, and I don't think, I don't think before that combined the balance check <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I guess, um, yeah, I guess there, there definitely was that anti-establishment, uh, you know, uh, streak or side to them. So, uh, but there again, it boils down to, you know, not giving a fuck and uh, playing by their rules and nobody else's rules. Um, so, yeah, sure, they probably could have you know, gone to the next level had they chose to play the game and they just, that wasn't what the replacements were about. I would, I mean, I, I would Boos Purdue have destroyed a, a dressing room at NBC? Um, no, probably not. You know, but then again, that's not who we were either. So, you know, it's, um, you know, it, it it's, you know, they had that, that wild, loose side, and, um, you know, I'm not saying that we were all business, but, but uh, you know, I guess that it, it wasn't really in our personality to, to do that type of thing, so. Is there anything else I can cover that you could add about the band or, or the scene? That, I mean, for someone who, I mean, someone who's watching this and may have never you know, someone younger who's never maybe even heard of either of their bands. Um, that, that just to sort of explain what was going on at that time, this amazing amount of creativity coming out of this little snowbound town in the Midwest. Hmm. Uh, nope. Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have anything prepared there, so. No, 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 that's, that's okay. I mean, um, do you think that being this little snowbound town in the middle of the Midwest sort of like bred creativity? Well, yeah, and, and actually a lot, of, a lot of people from Minneapolis have, and, and St. Paul have, have always thrown that out. It's like, okay, it's cold and dark here in the wintertime, and there's not a whole lot else to do, so let's get together in somebody's basement and make some music. Um, you know, recently I just, uh, um, Alan Sparhawk from uh, Lowe basically said the same thing about the Duluth scene. So, um, you know, it's... it's um, yeah, I don't know. It was it was just a lot of people coming together at the right time, and, and just a really great network and community of, of friends. And you know, it's like you know, um, all the bands that that uh, Reflex put out, they were all friends. You know, it's not like we went out and said, "Oh, uh, we have this record label, and uh, we really like your band, and we'd like to sign you," type of thing. So, um, you know, it was, it was just a good community it's like you know it's, it, everybody had an open mind and uh, there was so much diversity in the music that was 
being played in, in the entry and uh, Goofy's Upper Deck and, and um, uh, Duffy's and, and, and you know, the Longhorn or whatever. It's, it's, it was really a great scene. Yeah, maybe a little bit. You know, it's uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, Magnet put out uh, that, that piece a few years ago uh, ab about the breakup of the, of the band. And, um, and they chose to put us on, on the cover. And that was the first time that Husker Du had ever graced the cover of a um, U.S. music publication. Yeah. Wow. So, you know. Um, about 15, 15, 16, 17 years after the band broke up, so. Was, was it at least nice? It's like, finally, it's like, it's like, you know, it's, it's like, well, at least you guys got the cover and not the bats. Yeah, yeah, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, were they a great, a great rock and roll band? Uh, they were a great rock and roll band. I never actually saw any of the, uh, the train wrecks. Uh, only heard about them. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we, the, uh, the, the kiddie pool incident was, was told to me by uh, Casey McPherson, who uh, was their road manager for, for a tour or two, and Casey uh, road managed for us as well. Um, so when you saw them, they rocked. They rocked. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, did, was that, I mean, was that uh, loose? Thing they had going on was that a, in a way maybe just that just the pure essence of rock and roll. I mean, in the Stones kind of way. Maybe. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's um, you know it's it's one of those things where it's like well close enough for rock and roll. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, let me think here. Okay. I'm gonna. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that sums it up, you know, basically what you had kind of just said there about, you know, they, the, you know, they were loose in the same way that, that, you know, one of the things that made the Stones, I think, as great as, it, as they were back in, in um, uh, you know, leading up through the Mick Taylor years, that it was close enough for rock and roll. It was just, a, it's not exactly spot on. But it's not, you know, it's, it's just, you know, it's loose enough that everybody is just really kind of getting into it, so.